What discussions took place in 2020 and 2021 with investment managers? On well, the Treasury Minister to reply. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. In answering this question, I am assuming the Honourable Member refer is referring to the Treasury's investment managers. The Treasury employs its investment managers to manage its investment in accordance with the current agreed mandate. Over the period in question, a very large number of discussions were held with them, as one would expect. The discussions range as examples from making arrangements to ch change amounts allocated to each manager to invest, to meetings with the Investment Committee of the Treasury to understand portfolio performance and outlook. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Question, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for that overview. On how many occasions did the political member for Treasury meet with investment managers of the government's reserves in March 2020, and what was the purpose of the meetings? Minister to reply. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The political member for Treasury sits on the Investment Committee. The investment managers were invited to attend the Investment Committee meetings in person three times over the period in question. And the purpose of these meetings was for various things. Um, it was to discuss information on how each manager was addressing the pandemic internally in relation to the management of the government portfolio updates on the external market conditions and brief summaries on the circumstances that were causing fluctuations, um, updates on each individual manager's portfolio performance compared to their targets, and also Treasury were in frequent contact with the investment managers and all other communications were provided to the investment committee by either telephone and email conversations as well, and also reporting provided by the investment manager's investment advisor. Further supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Um, who's currently carrying out the role that that political member was carrying out in March 2020? And how, on how many occasions were extensions to the management contract given? And on each occasion, how much warning was given? And what factors led to the extensions? Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I stand to be corrected, but if I remember rightly, in the last administration, the Member of Treasury of the Investment Committee was Mr Shimmons. Um, it is now Mr Smith. Um, in relation to the contracts and the extension, um, Mr Speaker, um, the contracts have been extended a total of four times. Um, there was a three-month extension in June 2021, where formal notice had been given to the managers in October 2020. There was three months um, extension in September 21, um, with formal notice having been given to the managers in the June of 21. There was a three-month extension, 31st December 21, with formal notice given to managers in September 21, and a six-month extension, 30th of June 20, um, 2021, formal notice given to the managers, um, oh sorry, the six-month extension which is currently in place, to the 30th of June 2022, with formal notice given to the managers in December 21. Final supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, oh. Minister. Um, with regard to the final date, does that mean that, as the current tender process is ongoing, the existing managers are continuing to manage the existing portfolios? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The existing portfolio remains in place and continues to be managed until the new mandates are awarded. My apologies, I Mr. Thomas. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My recollection is that financial regulations require any contract extension to go to the, uh, the board responsible and the, uh, after advice from the accounting <coughs> officer. Can the uh, Treasury Minister confirm that all of the contract extensions went to the full Treasury board? And secondly, can the Minister uh, advise what the role is of the political member of the Investment Committee? Minister Trapani. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. The role of the political member of the Investment Committee is to be the political member on the committee, and um, to be frank, um, that, that, is their, that is their purpose and that is their role. In relation to the extensions and going to a Treasury Board, of course, I, I wasn't Treasury Minister at the time. I will need to take that away and check, and I will write to the Honourable Member and other Honourable Members too. Question two, call the Honourable Member for Douglas North. Mr Warrenberg. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd like to ask the... Uh, Minister for Infrastructure, whether there is a river management programme to tackle silting and blockages. Well, the Minister for Infrastructure complies. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The Department of Infrastructure is responsible for flood maintenance and management works on rivers classed as designated watercourses. There are 87 kilometres, 87 kilometres of designated rivers and watercourses which are considered of major importance for flood management. 
An annual programme of maintenance works across all designated watercourses is identified each year following inspections. The Department recently published a medium term, which is a five-year maintenance programme for the Laxey River, and is working towards publishing medium maintenance programmes for all designated watercourses. Landowners are responsible for maintenance and management of non-designated rivers running through their land. To assist landowners with their responsibilities, the Department has published a guide to watercourse management, which can be found on the IOM Flood Hub website. Mr Speaker, blockage pinch points on both designated and non-designated rivers have been identified and are checked periodically and after significant storm events so that action can be taken to remove debris build-up where there is a blockage potential leading to serious flood risk. Where appropriate, proactive works are carried out upstream of pinch points to manage debris load and to reduce the likelihood of blockages. The Department installed a debris catcher in Laxey Glen on Glenroy River to intercept large wooden, wood debris in an area of low risk consequence. With regard to river silting, the Department monitors sediment on designated watercourses at locations where accumulation would seriously impact flood risk. Sediment removal is undertaken sparingly where there are clear benefits in doing so. The Department manages the designated northern trenches, trench drainage rather, ditches, and there is an annual programme of silt removal where required to maintain channel conveyance. Our powers are permissive and we have no duty to undertake works where works are undertaken where there is a clear benefit. The Department can serve notice on a landowner if they are not maintaining a watercourse where appropriate flow is, of water is impeded and there is a serious flood risk. But the Department does work with private landowners and we look forward to continuous relationship over the coming years. Minister, uh, Mr Speaker, thank you. Supplementary question? No, no. Mr, no. Mr. Peters? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. One of my constituents is in a Mexican standoff with the DOI where he isn't able to clear a river blockage on his land without departmental approval. The department won't do the work itself, as the word may rather than must is used in the legislation, yet it insists on my constituent indemnifying them for any consequential problems as a result of him doing the work that they should possibly be doing. Does the Minister agree with me that his department must do this kind of work on flood rivers as a matter of urgency and in the national interest? Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the honourable member for his question. The landowner has issues with erosion on the river banks along the fields, as well as the creation of gravel shoals at the centre of the channel of the river. Erosion is a natural process, moving water naturally wears, uh, uh, moving water naturally wears away river banks, causing erosion. Landowners are responsible for work to reduce bank erosion, except in circumstances where there are significant flood risk benef reduction benefits. The Department has taken action only where natural erosion threatens a flood defence, vulnerable property or critical infrastructure. But I understand the, uh, and I am aware of the situation that the Honourable Member is talking about. I have met the landowner and in my original answer that's why I said we look forward to contain, continuing and uh, maintaining uh, a working relationship with the gentleman. Into question three, I call the Honourable Member for Douglas Central, Mrs. Corlett. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Could I ask the Minister for Infrastructure what plans the Department has to implement traffic calming measures and speed restrictions on the roads around Balakamine High School? I call the Minister for Infrastructure to reply. Thank you very much. As the Member is aware, Highways Officers are planning an in-depth and interactive consultation process to create a school streets trial around Balakamine High School. The Department anticipates this consultation will commence in the next couple of months as resources within the Department become available. Appropriate traffic calming and speed reduction measures will be considered as part of that cons consultation. The benefits from the school streets trial are expected to be decreased road danger, increased physical activity and reduced CO2 emissions. It will reallocate some of the road space around the schools to increase and encourage behaviour changes in students, parents and drivers in general. Subject to a successful outcome from the consultation, by which I mean proposals that are likely to deliver the above benefits, progress towards implementation will start when funding becomes available, hopefully in the 23-24 year. I am optimistic that this funding will be supported as the benefits of these measures will assist in the delivery of our island plan and help to build great communities, health and well-being and an environment of which we can be proud. So for a question, Mrs Corlett. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, almost every resident that I spoke to wanted a speed reduction, and that's what I've been asking for on their behalf. In an answer to a previous question, the Minister said that it, that couldn't be achieved without traffic calming. So my questions are, 
does this department propose significant changes to the roads surrounding the school? And if so, does he think there may be con controversy in the plans? Minister's reply. Um, first and foremost, I would say, since I was aware of this question, I've spent a bit of time up in the area, driving around there, looking around there at the issues myself, uh, and listening to the head teacher this morning on the radio, I think she alluded to quite a few of the issues up there, which is the volume of traffic at certain times of the day. Um, 20 mile an hour speed limits are probably self-imposing at certain times of the day, especially up and down there, uh, and it is due to the school, if I can, you know, I'll be blunt and say it's due to the school, whether it be the teachers or the students that are using it. Um, we will work with everybody in the area, including you know, the um, residents and the school, and see if we can <laughs> reduce the amount there. If we end up putting in physical structures to reduce the speed limits up there, it will cost potentially hundreds of thousands of pounds for what I think may well be not unnecessary when, when you look around at the moment. Say it, very, is very, it, it regulates itself. Uh, most people are driving at 20 or less, I would say, during that time. I'm more than happy to speak with the Honourable Member uh, and obviously the Department will come to her and her colleague for the area um, when we go to consultation. Before we go out to consultation, we will talk with them and the school. Um, but more than happy to discuss this with you at length. Final question, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Department consider assessing challenges at all schools? Arby School, for example, have... No, no. Honourable Member, I'm going to stop you right there. Excellent an example, Mr. No, Speaker. I, I want you to keep to Ballard Community High School, please, Honourable Member. Can I miss that bit out then about Arby School? <laughs> 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 you can ask questions about implementing traffic calming measures at Ballard Community. Oh, Otherwise, yeah. yeah but with, with regard to schools, could an overall assessment no, be. Ballard Community <laughs> School, Mr. Morehouse. With Ballard Community <laughs> School in the first instance, then potentially roll down. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've given you more than enough opportunity to raise a, a, a question that's in order. Mr Thomas, supplementary question. Uh, thank you, um, Mr Speaker, and to help a uh, friend from down south, can the Minister confirm that the next uh, pilot and the next implementation will be in a, in a school that serves a substantial part of the population, perhaps at St Ninian's, which is also crying out <laughs> for... Uh, <laughs> your seat. We're not going to broaden this out. Uh, supplementary question, Mrs. Corlett. No, no, I'll, you, I'll put you back in the queue, Mrs. Corlett. <laughs> um, would the Minister agree with me that actually, yes, 20 mile an hour is probably the maximum speed you can go early in the morning or at, at tea time. But the, the considerations are around other times too for the residents in the area as regards speed, not only for the students. Um, and the, uh, the, the Minister has stated that there is intention to, to consult on the traffic calming proposals in the area. Um, just would the Minister provide some, just some reassurance that um, residents will be fully engaged with the, with the process and that, that his department will listen to the people that actually live in the area? No. Thank you. A question about the subject. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah, I absolutely agree with the Honourable Member when she says it's not just at the school times, it's at other times, and that is an island-wide issue. Trying to enforce anything under 30 is an issue for the police as well. It's very hard to do. But we will absolutely consult with the members, with the local residents and with the schools and anybody else interested in this area, and for those other members, when we get around to doing it, the other schools as well, Mr Speaker. <laughs> Final supplementary, Mr Thomas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Would the um, Minister like to confirm that his department uh, engaged consultants in winter 2020-21 to work up proposals for around Balakameen High School spending money and that very kindly those consultants and the officers presented those to Mrs Corlett and myself uh, with a view to launching this consultation in April 2021 and secondly would the Minister like to confirm that there um, there must have been a proposal for, these, uh, for the expenditure on these plans put forward because that's what officers told us and that's as part of a five-year plan for residential roads around schools. So it must have been turned down somewhere in the process. Minister, to reply. I am aware that there was a consultation done and plans were drawn up prior to my time in the department um, and the honourable members were obviously consulted on those. There was a, a bid put into Treasury for some, uh, for some finances to do the work this year, which wasn't successful, but that doesn't mean that we can't continue and look at the schemes up and around that area, which I'm happy to do with the Honourable Members and everybody else involved. Thank you. Question four, call the Honourable Member for Oncom, Mr Colston. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for the Cabinet Office why the household and other economic information referred to on page two of the 2021 Census Report Part 1 is not to be published until June, and if she will make a statement? Will the Minister for the Cabinet Office to reply? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for his question. A phased approach to the census results was adopted in order to make key demographic data publicly available as soon as possible. The second report will contain further data which is dependent on quality assurance being completed on the occupational and economic sector data coding for analysis. The employment and job description information provided by the public on the census forms are subsequently coded into standard economic and occupational sectors. This coding enables the analysis of employment data by economic sector and occupations. Whilst the report will be laid before the June sitting of Timwald, it will be publicly available by the Register of Business from the 10th of May. So, a question, Mr. Coster. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that clarification and statement this morning. Just so I've got it absolutely right, as, as you can see, the reason for the question this morning was because Part One has been put onto the Register of Business. So, at some point, we will be debating that document. But given the fact that we are having a debate on the census, can the Minister give reassurance that we'll have all of the information to have a full debate in Timwald? Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think previously um, the census findings, the census reports, has just been laid before Tim Walt. Um, and yes, I can commit that the um, additional information that the honourable member referred to in his question will be publicly available um, on the Register of Business from the 10th of May. So, a bunch of questions, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, in terms of the inputted data by the people, was that automatically then transferred by the computer system? into the output required, or is there a manual input that is slowing down the process? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, there is there's obviously various ways of doing this. You know, it is not all fully automated. It does require on the coding and the analysis. Um, I think the honourable member is, is sort of saying, why does it take so long to complete? Um, Upon inquiry, I am advised that it typically takes about a year after census night before the census results are ready to be issued in a report and laid before Tim Wald. Uh, that was the case in 2016 and 2011. And um, against that benchmark, uh, this report is in fact four months ahead of schedule. The, um, the three most important factors that determine the timescales for the census report that I think probably the Honourable Member is interested in, and this is regardless of what method is used to collect the data, uh, and these, some of these things are largely outside of government control are the rate at which households complete and submit their forms after census night, the time taken to visit households which have not yet submitted a form, and the degree of quality checking that has to be performed. Um, previous experience has shown that, fact that these factors make for a lengthy process involving multiple reminder notices and visits to properties being made, in addition to a large number of households that have to be contacted to um, to obtain and complete information. So the, the coding is part of the quality assurance and, um, and, and that's obviously that quality assurance is an important part of the process that, that takes time. And um, that sort of quality assurance review is in common with uh, other aspects of handling official statistics. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Thomas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can the Minister confirm that a, a great number of Isle of Man statistics uh, documents publishing their uh, investigations are actually Isle of Man statistics documents and they're laid before Timwald, they're not Timwald documents. And secondly, can the, um, can the Minister can, uh, confirm that there will this time be a review of the process, a helpful review of the process like there was in 2016 and 2011 so that we can learn lessons? And part of the issue this time is that the uh, predecessor was rather optimistic about the impact of um, using a digital approach because at the end of the day the difficult 4,000 households will still remain difficult despite the fact that the easy ones will fill it in online if asked to do so. Minister's reply. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm, I'm happy to, to, to confirm that I will ask for a review of processes. I think that's, that's a good idea, just as a matter of course. Um, and I wasn't sure that I said that the census was a Timwall document. I was just merely referring to the process at which it gets laid before Timwall. It is produced by, by Cabinet Office um, in the statistics section of Cabinet Office, as the Honourable Member suggested. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question 5. Call the Honourable Member for Douglas Central, Mr Thomas. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'd like to ask the Minister for the Cabinet Office when the Council of Ministers will report, pursuant to the Tin World Resolution of June 2021, on its investigation of the impact on employee structures of the removal of the personnel control mechanism. I then call the Minister for the Cabinet Office to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the um, report is scheduled to be laid before the April sitting of Tim World, subject to the necessary approvals. Okay. Thank you much. Question six. I call the Honourable Member for Douglas Central, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to ask the Minister for the Cabinet Office who is considering, pursuant to the Tinwald Resolution of October 2021, how the terms of employment of the Chief Executive Officer or equivalent of every Government Department Board and Office should include annual performance related targets and a performance related element of pay. Again, call the Minister for the Cabinet Office to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Honourable Member for his question and just to provide a bit of context and background to that, that um, motion in October. Um, it was in July 2021 that an amendment uh, to the motion was tabled, which proposed including the work, in the work referred to in the programme for government, after which the date was suspended, it being towards the end of the administration. The October sitting of Timwell came just a couple of days into the start of this new Council of Ministers, and um, I moved an amendment that uh, calls on the Council of Ministers to include this work stream in the island plan by January 2022. As honourable members will recall, the island plan was approved by Timwell on the 1st of February 2022. That plan requires every department and board to produce an annual report to Tinwald for debate and scrutiny, along with delivery dates. The reports will set out the actions undertaken and will determine and justify staffing levels across the organisation. A new important performance management measure was quickly agreed by the new Council of Ministers in the second week. In order for Chief Executives to be held accountable for the delivery of departmental objectives, Ministers have delegated authority to the Chief Secretary to allow him to performance manage Chief, Chief Executives, ensuring that they meet agreed standards as outlined in the performance framework. Looking specifically at the performance-related element of pay that the, the Honourable Member is inquiring about, the um, previous Minister for Policy and Reform advised in July 2021 in the Timwell sitting that performance related pay has wide implications for the entire public service so given the scale of the motion it is only correct that the work is captured in the next programme for government and will undoubtedly require work as a consequence of both intended and unintended uh, uh, consequences and um, this work will be picked up in the reform of government elements of the island plan on page 17 which states improving how government functions is structured and how services are delivered will be progressed as a separate work stream which will run alongside the delivery of the island plan where appropriate the office of human resources will be bringing forward proposals on the perform performance related pay options for implementation based on experience in the private sector and in other jurisdictions to the council of ministers in the coming months. <coughs> Progress on this work stream is overseen by the Islands Plan Delivery Committee, chaired by the Chief Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. So going to question, Mr Thomas. Thank you. <coughs> Lots of new information there, and I'm delighted that the uh, previous discussion of this, uh, in which I was involved in, in this place, has, has obviously been helpful to take things forward. What um, external input and, and what mechanism will the uh, Office of Herman, Human Resources used to get external input into that, the proposal to let uh, departments uh, do the staffing and management and structure review themselves and also to let uh, the chief executive as a corporate action um, review other chief executives with, with whom he works every week in the chief officer group. Minister's reply. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I think some of those questions are getting into sort of operational and management detail now. I don't have that with me. I think probably the Honourable Mayor is referring to the Chief Secretary Management, having line management of Chief Executives. Um, I think when such information becomes clear, it will be first for the consideration of the Island Plan Delivery Committee and then for the Council of Ministers. But at the moment, this matters with the Office of Human Resources. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Thomas. Thank you, um, <coughs> Mr Speaker. This was a line taken by the Minister of Health and Social Care uh, last week in this place. Does the Minister not agree with me that it is absolutely important that the Ministers and the Council of Ministers collectively get hold of the size, structure and scope of government, the employee structures and the amount and the size and the number of people working in government, and also that the way that public servants and uh, operational managers are actually uh, looked after and it can't be left just to the departments to set themselves objectives and review themselves? To the extent that that refers to the Chief Executive's performance and pay, Minister to apply. 
Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I agree with many of the points the Honourable Member makes. In connection with the performance management framework, um, I can answer that. That has um, five sections to it, which are defined as performance expectations, um, strategic corporate priorities, business priorities, personal leadership and performance appraisal, appraisal and evaluation discussion. The Chief Secretary will conduct quarterly performance appraisals with Chief Executive Officers in addition to monthly one-to-one -one meetings. Um, this sort of thing is, is, is a new thing to happen because, precisely because of the change that was made to link in the um, accountability and lines management from the Chief Executive to the Chief Secretary, which happened very early on in this administration. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, uh, turn to question seven, calling the Honourable Member for Arby Castell Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I would like to ask the Minister for Education, Sports and Culture what assessment of the learning environment in schools has been carried out since March 2020? Call well, the Minister for Education, Sport and Culture to reply. Thank you, Mr Speaker. An effective learning environment is a key component for maximising engaging learning. Factors within the learning environment include the physical environment, organisation of that environment and the climate for learning that is created between teachers and students, including relationships. Schools carry out regular monitoring and review activities as part of the continuous self-evaluation and improvement programme. This would include the learning environment. There is also an annual health and safety walkthrough where governors are invited to walk around the school environment to review from a health and safety aspect and health and safety is a regular agenda item at governors meetings. This process is ongoing and has continued since March 2020 and education advice and support partners have supported schools in this where requested during this period. Health and safety assessments are a continuous basis in schools and we comply with all health and safety legislation, including any specific requirements during the stages of the COVID-19 response. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Questions to Morehouse. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you, Minister. <coughs> In our island plan, there is a significant section on an environment we can be proud of. We then arrive at the learning section, and there's no mention of the learning environment. Why was that aspect of learning not included? And will it become part of the evolving plan? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, the point with regards to um, the island plan and the outstanding lifelong learning and development opportunities for all, that section refers to every child having access to excellent education and childcare. An effective part of that is the learning environment, which would be part of achieving this. Question, Mrs. Maltby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As a former member of staff working in a school environment for over 14 years, I can vouch that many of our schools are crying out for a full strategic infrastructure needs assessment. Would the Minister agree with me that this approach would make much better economic sense and if she has given consideration to this type of assessment? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I completely agree with what the Honourable Colleague um, and previous work colleague as well has stated. A full strategic infrastructure needs assessment is required and we will be working with Treasury to ensure that this is in place for our schools. Further supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, many schools really struggle to do the proprietary work needed to welcome students back on Monday the 15th of June 2020. Fortunately, the removal of social distancing happened on the same day. Was any subsequent review carried out to ensure that if that was to happen again, there would be a better outcome than potentially could have happened in June 2020? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Minister Triplein. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, the Honourable colleague, um, who obviously was previously a teacher, he knows full well that the head teachers are responsible for their environments and ensuring the safety and access to everything that students need on that day. Um, with regards to the date in mind when we went back straight after COVID, um, the procedures that would have been in place prior to COVID, if social distancing would have been back in place, would have been applied. Supplementary question, Mr Thomas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I welcome that announcement that a strategic assessment is needed. Back in July, the now minister was a backbencher, July last year, and um, she asked an excellent question, which I supported, about the accommodation strategy. And at that time, she said she was waiting for a condition survey from, for, um, from the Department of Infrastructure of all of the schools. Has that condition survey been produced uh, for all of the schools? And is the, uh, it, will the accommodation strategy be part of the strategic assessment that the minister's referred to? Yes, Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, that 
assessment hasn't been completed. It is something since I've become Minister that I'm keen to see. Um, and obviously we'll work with our infrastructure colleagues to ensure that is continued um, because that is as important as a strategic infrastructure needs assessment to look at the strategic priority of schools in areas of the island. Final supplementary question, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr Speaker. With regard to the previous question, in terms of the challenges that were being faced potentially in June 2020, the key concern there was in terms of the structure of the buildings, and that is a limiting factor. And just extending from that, um, a common thread throughout all these issues is a lack of appropriate space. That's a quote from the Newcastle Russian High School Strategic Brief 2019. Since then, student numbers have increased and the pressures have increased tremendously. In terms of the school environments being, comp being struggling to deal with increasing number of students in certain areas, is the Education Department aware of these challenges and looking at solutions to specific school problems across the island. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yes, it's reply. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member because clearly he's going to fully support a strategic infrastructure needs assessment which would look at class sizes. Um, but we do have schools, particularly at secondary level, where there are constrained teaching spaces and modifications are undertaken where possible to improve the size and flexibility of such spaces or alternatively schools have to manage with such constraints through alternative learning methods or by reducing class sizes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question 8. Call the Honourable Member for Arbor, Cass, Emily, and Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I would like to ask the Minister for Education, Sport and Culture when she last visited Cass High School and if she will make a statement. The Minister for Education, Sport and Culture should reply. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, the Honourable Member is obviously already aware that myself um, and the Chief Minister visited on Monday the 28th of February um, to look around the school and see the progress being made with the development of the new playing fields as well. We met with the head teacher to discuss the current school building and plans for its future. As I have previously answered, a detailed feasibility study has been completed for a school. The feasibility study and plans have been produced to enable further dialogue over the strategic scope, capacity, overall floor area and cost. My department is currently working with Treasury to agree the next steps in the process. Thank you, question. Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. In the final response to question seven, the Minister made reference to the challenge of space and Hopefully, when she visited Castle Russian last week, she really did become, become aware of the challenge of space and the way in which students having to be educated elsewhere and the way in which Year 9 students in the summer are potentially going to have limited options available to them. Thus, she recognised this limit to space is a real concern and impacting on potential learning within the school environment. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I do accept that limiting space um, is an issue probably in the majority of, of our schools, um, not just Castle Russian, um, but I do accept that this has been ongoing for some time and I do agree that <coughs> progress needs to be made. Unfortunately, the process does take time and dialogue over the scope, capacity, overall floor area and the cost and <coughs> we need to ensure that whatever is proposed meets the future educational needs of our students and capacity. Supplementary, Mr Thomas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. One way to deal with uh, lack of space is to have an extension. Can the Minister um, assure me that, uh, that she has or will engage with the Department of Infrastructure people and also perhaps even Manx Development Corporation, now they've looked at schools on sites like Park Road, um, will engage with the idea of actually extending rather than just knocking down and rebuilding the Castle Russian High School? Reply. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, I am actually meeting with the Manx Development Corporation with regards to the Brownfield site that's currently Park Road um, later this week um, and obviously I'll, I'll be very interested after all honourable members we've seen um, what work they've been able to do with the old nurses home and obviously we need to look at all options for um, all of our schools including extensions or refurbishment, extensive refurbishment projects. Supplementary question Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr Speaker. When you visited the school, were you able to go to the science labs on the first floor? Because concerns were raised about those in a DOI FOI request 1849793 last year. In terms of four laboratories, where there was the actual quote, with inadequate means of escape in the event of a fire or other emergencies. 
in terms of the risks we're putting our children in, is the Minister really going to try and push something forward in terms of solutions, not in the long term, in the short term, to what is happening at Castle Russian? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. And um, I clearly will rely on the professionals, the head teacher and the teachers of science know their labs and they know how to operate them safely. Um, with regards to whether the Chief Minister and I visited a science lab, we certainly did go through the science lab area on the top floor. Um, at the time, they were not very highly populated, um, but certainly um, I know that the rooms do link. However, that does help with collaborative teaching within these environments. Come to question, Mrs. Maltby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's all well good talking about space and extending our schools, but we haven't got the teachers to fill these schools. Maybe uh, we need to think about that a little bit more. So I would wonder if the minister would like to take this opportunity to advertise for more for teachers to come to the Isle of Man to live and work. Context of her visit to Castle Russian, how that came up. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, obviously, I have a question um, <coughs> further on the order paper with regards to staffing. Uh, final supplementary, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, just going back to the previous supplementary, in terms of the safety within those science labs, it's not to be put in the hands of the individual teachers. In terms of the FOI information, it was clearly stated by DOI that those laboratories were unsafe in terms of access. There was a single door and there were issues linked to that. But in terms of other areas, the Castle Russian High School Strategic Brief 2019, which hopefully the Minister has had a chance to look at, really did <coughs> highlight other areas such as equality access, lack of study and social areas, and the dining facility. Are those all things that, after the visit, in addition to all the hard-working teachers, and all the positive things that were going on. Are those things that you took away with? Because in terms of equality access, that is a really important thing that we really must consider and take forward in a better way. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Yes, the um, visit was very informative. Um, as a previous um, member of the leadership team at Balakameen, which is the largest, probably most overcrowded school on the island, um, I did see some synergies, um, but you know, not all. However, as I've said, we will be doing a full assessment of what's required on that site and make sure we come forward with a solution that is fit for purpose for the future for any additional um, students, because the Honourable Member has mentioned that the role is going up and we need to look at what that future role is and try and make sure we've got capacity so it's not full when any changes or a new school opens. Question nine. <coughs> Call the Honourable Member for Douglas Central, Mrs Corley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd like to ask the Minister for Education, Sport and Culture what plans her department has to address the capacity issues in secondary education facilities in the East. Or the Minister for Education, Sport and Culture, for Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member um, for her question. Um, the pupil population in the East is higher than other areas of the island. There is sufficient capacity overall in the East for the island when considering the number of school places and the capacity available at both Balakameen and St Ninian school sites. However, catchment area legislation is currently under review and the intention is to bring legislation forward, hopefully in this parliamentary year. The intention is for Henry Bloom Noble School, as well as School and Jubilee, to be joint catchment areas for Balakameen and St Ninian's, Braddon School is also intended to be a joint catchment area for QE2, St Ninian's and Balakameen. As it currently isn't formalised by legislation, parents who wish their child to attend a school other than their catchment area still need to complete an out-of-area catchment request. Secondary schools work with our primary schools to organise transition events for children going, into primary, going from primary to secondary. They also have openings where parents can view the relevant secondary school. The process is currently ongoing for September's intake and with regards to um, the numbers, we don't have the finalised numbers at present. Measures are being explored by the department to try and alleviate capacity issues including sixth form collaboration. Any broader discussion will involve a number of key stakeholders and if necessary will go to public consultation prior to any resolution being finalised. Thank you Mr Speaker. Does the Minister feel that changing catchment areas for Henry Bloom Noble or School and Jubilee will actually encourage more people to go to St Ninian's as most of the children that go to Henry Bloom Noble live probably within walking distance of 
Balakameen, and the children that go to school in Jubilee already have to move from the, um, the, the site at, at um, Balakwale Road to Murray's Road, then they would have to move to Bemahague and then on to St Ninian's, all before they take their GCSEs. Are parents really going to be encouraged to move to, to St Ninian's when they have to make those, those many moves in between? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, I totally agree with the Honourable Member um, with regards to um, parents and making um, decisions, but with regards to a catchment area view, this needs to be looked at completely and to make sure that we have the right balance and numbers of students with access to schools in their areas as possible. Um, and obviously alternatives that are arranged, um, I suppose the word to use is it's an encouragement process at the minute from both the schools to put on the application process that students from these other schools can go to either or of the schools. To question Mr Thomas. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I agree completely with the Minister that this issue has to look, be looked at uh, completely, as she says. Does the Minister agree with me that looking at the catchment area issue completely would include getting rid of catchment areas? Secondly, does she agree that it might include having a sixth form centre for Douglas rather than sharing sixth forms? And thirdly, does she agree that we really need to be bold about this and take the opportunities that Balakameen, um, sorry, that Bemaheg expansion possibilities, extension possibilities um, exist and they, so they should be used rationally, perhaps with a combined Douglas secondary school? Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank, thank the Honourable Member. Um, obviously, East is our area where we've got capacity. I don't think it's appropriate just to have 10 mobile classrooms on a site at Balakameen with very crammed corridors. Um, was an opportunity missed with regards to Bermahaig years ago? I think it probably was, but we need to look at this overall to make sure that going forward we've got a full strategic infrastructure needs assessment for schools in all areas of the island. That's a bunch of questions, Mrs Caller. <coughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. I mean, the Minister has just stated in a, in a previous answer how important the learning environment is. Um, Balakameen is, I stand to be corrected, about 300 pupils over capacity, St Indians around 300 under. <coughs> For Balakameen, this is not just a few extra pupils on the whole, it's a few hundred. And in the Minister's opinion, is this causing a significant impact on learning or student wellbeing? And are there any financial resources available? to make the changes that would be required to deal with the problem. Minister to reply. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I would hope, um, following a full infrastructure needs assessment, that Treasury would then be on board to look at the future priorities for the island. Um, with regards to, to Balakameen, um, there clearly has been an ongoing issue for a number of years, and what we need to look, look at is make sure that all students on the island have access to an equal and fair environment for education with um, opportunities for outcomes for all. Um, as, as we know, um, the head teacher at Balakameen um, has, over a number of years, tried to do additional extensions at Balakameen. I'm not so sure that is the right, right thing to do. And temporary mobile classrooms has been the solution, but we need to look at this as a whole in the East to make sure that the opportunity and the capacity is available for the future. Mr Thomas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does the Minister agree with me that looking at the capacity issues in secondary education facilities in the East could also involve choosing the location of the next new primary school or refurbished primary school that's needed in the, in the East? For instance, um, although the people of um, Central Douglas, I'm sure, are very grateful for the new facilities at Henry Bloom Noble and at and at St Mary's School, we do have the gap in Scotland Jubilee and we need work on that. Could the Minister undertake to come back to us with a timetable for consideration of how that's going to be dealt with as part of her strategic infrastructure needs assessment and condition survey and all the other surveys that are going on with the Department of Infrastructure? Minister 
Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm happy to commit to that. And as stated previously, I'm meeting um, with the Manx Development Corporation with regards to the Brownfield site, which is Park Road, which was assigned and, um, for a replacement for school in Jubilee. Um, however, we all know the infrastructure around that area is quite tight, so until I've had that meeting, I can't really give you any more further information, but quite happy to come back. <coughs> And once I've got the um, condition surveys, etc., to liaise and report that to members. Call the honourable member for Douglas Central Trust. Question 10, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, I beg to ask the Minister for Health and Social Care how his department's management, payroll, and budget has changed since the establishment of Manx Care and the Health and Care Transformation Programme, and how he expects it to change in the next three years. The Minister for Health and Social Care to reply. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The overall departmental payroll costs have changed quite significantly since the introduction of the Manx Care Act, which established Manx Care and the redesigned Department of Health and Social Care from the 1st of April 2021. Prior to the split of Manx Care, the total staff budget expenditure for 2020-2021 for the whole Department of Health and Social Care was just over £162 million, and the full-time overall equivalent for the organisation in terms of staffing was 3215 the management structures of both the redesigned department and Manx Care were estimated as an additional cost annually of £3.5 million. Turning to the department itself, the redesigned departmental budget staffing costs are £2.9 million for the current financial year, and the forecast spend for the year is £2.3 million. This represents a total of 30 staff in post as at January 2022, with a full establishment staffing of 37 full-time equivalent staff, excluding bank and board members. The equivalent budget for the year 2020-2021, being the year prior to Manx Care going live, was in the region of £2.6 million. The Department will work as part of the routine annual budget process to review its workforce and operational budget needs focused on delivering its statutory functions and the development of policies to inform both the mandate and its legislative programme. After 12 months' operation of the redesigned Department, the next three years' forecast for the Department's payroll and budget baseline are expected to increase only subject to inflation and any pay award budget allocation that will be derived from the Treasury's medium-term financial strategy. The pink book uh, budget forecasts are for 2022-23, £3,028,646, pounds, and for 2023-24, £3,089,219. Pounds. Mr. Thomas. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker and to the Minister for that uh, information. D does the Minister understand that there might be a public perception which needs to be addressed that just new layers of management have been created and new layers of payroll for management have been created? So, for instance, the Department of Home Affairs manages three entities like M Manx Care with the um, constabulary and the, uh, and the police and, and, other, and, 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 sorry, and the probation prison and uh, other areas in, in various parts. But the Department of um, Health and Social Care just has Manx Care to look, to look after. So can the, um, can, can the public expect that the uh, management and payroll of the Department of Health, Health and Social Care will go down from 37 towards the sort of 10 or so that are in the Department of Home Affairs in coming years? Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I think there's a fundamental lack of understanding on behalf of the Honourable Members to the functions of the Department. So, for example, approximately half the members of staff in the Department work for the Registration and Inspection Team. Uh, this is the regulatory function that covers the regulation of adult daycare services, residential care homes, adoption services, fostering services, childcare services and childminders. Uh, that is approximately half of the Department's staff. On top of that, the Department is required to oversee the quality and safety uh, of operations and uh, for the performance of Manx Care in order to perform some form of assurance, and additionally, we have to undertake assurance around the mandate functions, which is essentially the whole health and care uh, social system, uh, which, as I mentioned before, uh, has staffing costs itself of around 160 million and nearly 3,000 staff, uh, which I would argue is substantially higher uh, than uh, the Department of Home Affairs. Question, Mr. Thomas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I'm glad the Minister agrees with me then. So if you take out the 20 from the independent in registration and inspection team, you get, you get your approach in the sorts of levels in the Department of Home Affairs. Is there any incentive for, um, for staff to um, management particularly to want to move to man Manx Care rather than stay with the Department of Health and Social Care in terms of pensions and in terms of uh, payroll, for instance, specifically? Um, how does... Um, how does how, how's the new terms for new starters apply in Manx Care relative to Department of Health and Social Care? And secondly, can we expect in time Manx Care to start paying as an, an arm's length body to start paying in the same way that, for instance, the Manx Utilities Authority does into the pension scheme? Yes, sure. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The question was about the department's staffing, uh, not Manx Care. Uh, I'm not in a position to comment at all on Manx Care staffing structure or policy. They are matters for Manx Care. Uh, as far as I'm aware, there are no incentives to incentivise staff to transfer between various organisations. Final point, Mr. Thomas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So the, the, the same answer has been given in two consecutive weeks. So it's nothing to do with me. What's going on at Manx Care in terms of staffing and payroll? Can the minister confirm that the Minister for Health and Social Care is responsible for hundreds of millions of pounds of expenditure? And it does matter, especially in terms of comparison with other public servants, what's uh, what's going on in term, at Manx Care in terms of staffing, especially given what Sir Jonathan Michaels found in terms of his last but one recommendation in terms of culture, in terms of excessive pay level, apparently, in certain, in certain specialist areas, and that the minister, need, minister needs to pay special attention to workforce issues. Minister, to reply. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Again, this question was about the department's uh, payroll, the department's management and the department's staffing structure, not about Manx Care. Question 11. I call the Honourable Member for Castamoli, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I would like to ask the Chair of the Office of Fair Trading how much money was held by Manx Gas on the 1st of March 2022 in domestic gas customers' prepayment accounts, and how much was held by the Manx Utilities Authority on the same date in domestic electricity consumer prepayment accounts? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Chair of the Office of Fair Trading to reply. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for Arbury Castle Town and Malou for his question. As the Office of Fair Trading does not hold the information requested, we have made inquiries of Manx Gas and the Manx Utilities Authority. The OFT has not had any responsibility for regulating the gas market in the Isle of Man since the agreement to which it and Manx Gas were parties was terminated on the 30th of December 2020. Manx Gas confirmed that it could provide the information requested but was not able to do so within the time constraint, indicating that it would appreciate additional context from the Honourable Member to enable it to provide a definitive answer. The OFT has also established that the Communications and Utilities Regulatory Authority does not hold the information on Manx Gas either. The Manx Utilities Authority responded as follows. Manx Utilities estimate the prepaid amount for domestic customers held on the 1st of March 2022 was 3.6 million. These balances generally arise from customers who pay for electricity charges <coughs> using a fixed monthly direct debit. Manx Utilities invoices domestic customers every three months and the prepaid amounts largely related to timing issues between the fixed monthly direct debit collections and the issuing of quarterly invoices. Regular account reviews are undertaken to monitor customer balances to reduce the risk of large or inappropriate debt and credit balances arising. Any customer concerned with their account balance is encouraged to contact Manx Utilities' customer billing team to request a re review of their account. Question, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Chairman. Um, in terms of the OFT, do they currently have any powers in terms of monitoring such accounts at the MUA and Manx Gas in terms of their role, their financial roles, and the checks they're able to carry out? Is there anything there that the um, Office of Fair Trading can carry out? Thank you. Chairman, to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With regard to any prepayments held by Manx Gas, I am unable to answer the question, the Honourable Member's question, at this juncture. But the OFT can, if requested to do so, take steps to establish what, if any, protection customers of Manx Gas are afforded. I would reiterate that the OFT is no longer has any responsibility for regulating the gas market on the Isle of Man. With regard to prepayments held by the MUA, I would respectfully ask the Honourable Member to redirect the supplementary question to the Chair of the MUA for his definitive answer. Thank you. Point of question, Mr. Thomas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And for the avoidance of doubt, um, does the chair want to confirm that the Office of Fair Trading is still responsible for consumer credit and consumer protection legislation in the Isle of Man? So, for instance, the Manx Gas Domestic Cus Customer Agreement does refer to the 1991 consumer legislation, which ultimately would go back to the Office of Fair Trading, and you could get advice. Um, uh, from the Office of Fair Trading about your rights under that Act, I'm sure. And secondly, I'm sure that applies also to the Manx Utilities, although I haven't looked into it. Thirdly, would the uh, Chair like to agree that we do need to um, take further steps to protect uh, people who can pay by direct debit and also the people who take out new accounts and have to put a deposit with um, Manx Gas for the first 12 months or pay at least £20, I believe, into an electricity meter before they get an account. Does the, does the Chair agree with me? This would be something worth looking at in the future. 
Chairman's reply. Yes, certainly uh, we can look at that at board level, and I can come back to you on that one as soon as we do that. Thank you. Supplementary question, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, it's quite an opaque area, and there doesn't appear to be any clear control over this situation. In terms of these two big energy providers, if one of them was to um, cease trading, would there be any protection from the point of view of the Office of Fair Trading in terms of those prepayment accounts and the money held in them? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chairman's reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As far as I'm aware, Manx Gas is a private limited company, so customers owed money would become creditors. The MUA is the statutory board. With regard to the prepayments held by the MUA, I would respectfully ask the Honourable Member to redirect once again to the Chairman of the MUA. To, turn to question 12. I'll call on the Honourable Member Fabi Castamalu. Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I would like to ask the Minister for Education, Sport and Culture whether there are any staffing issues in schools and if she will make a statement. Or the Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Schools recruit as and when vacancies arrive. Currently, there are eight teaching posts being advertised. The last day teachers can resign to finish at the end of this academic year is 31st of May, and so schools will recruit accordingly. As I mentioned in my answer to the Honourable Member for Russian, Dr Hayward, last week, for secondary teaching, there is a secondary teacher recruitment working group comprising of colleagues from the Department of Enterprise, Office of Human Resources and the Department of Education, Sport and Culture to review and improve the recruitment of secondary teachers. Senior management posts are advertised as and when they arise and interested applicants can apply in the usual way on job train. The recruitment panel for the post will determine who is appointed. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, concerns have been raised that rather than speaking to the frustrated and disillusioned teachers at Balakameen, the CEO of DESK is due to speak to the members of staff who have actually handed in their notice. When the visit takes place, could a wider consultation take place? And also, with regard to the reports on Manx Radio yesterday about teachers now really struggling to survive and even using the food bank, is that something that is on the agenda of the Education Department? Is it something they're looking at and considering as a real threat to the profession? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Minister to reply. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And um, as the Honourable M Member knows, there is currently ongoing negotiations with regards to um, pay. And um, obviously, I can't comment on that. But clearly, um, with regards to the Chief Executive visiting Balakameen, um, school yesterday that was cancelled by the school. However, the, the chief executive is currently arranging meetings with all schools um, in order to meet with the staff and ensure positive two-way communication takes place. Um, this perhaps has been delayed due to COVID and um, obviously some of the staffing issues around COVID. But with regards to um, teachers leaving the island, currently we have four teachers leaving at Easter, one from primary and three from secondary. Um, and it should be noted that this is early in the year and these numbers may continue to fluctuate. But with regards to um, the final day, teachers can resign to finish this academic year, which is the end of August. It's not July, as people will think, um, is the 31st of May. It's a plenty of questions to Morehouse. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you, Minister. In terms of mechanisms in place or mechanisms that could be put in place, has the Department actually considered ways in which the concerns of teachers could be shared anonymously with the department. It's one important thing to have good communications, and many teachers feel an individual threat, an individual concern, and you speak to the union, you speak to head teachers, but on the ground floor there are lots and lots of concerned individuals, and they would like to get that information to you. So is there any way that can actually happen? And it's become more concerning since the release of the FOI request on the Have You Stayed survey, whereas some teachers use that as a mechanism to share their thoughts, but in terms of that becoming a public document, that's also disappeared. So is there any way in which the teacher's voice can be heard within the Education Department? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, as Minister, I do receive contact from quite a large number of teachers um, directly um, with regards to lots of issues. With regards to an anonymous um, way of reporting, um, certainly previously as uh, somebody that's promoted whistleblowers, I do believe that 
every employee should have an opportunity to record concerns, um, but I think more importantly is that these concerns are listened to, and I'm happy to listen to any concerns from any of our teaching staff as to the reasons why they're leaving. And um, quite, quite clearly, there has been reports on Manx Road in the last couple of days um, with regards to struggles of, of some teachers, and you know the pay for teachers is quite low when you start in teaching. However, there are opportunities to rise, but sometimes this may be not as quick, and we do need to be looking at the best way to recruit, retain teachers on the island, and this involves a number of issues outside of pay, as well as housing and key worker properties. Final supplementary question, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Has the age profile of teaching staff who left the classroom in the last 12 months been considered? Uh, in terms of anecdotal evidence, there appears to be the suggestion that an abnormal number of younger teachers are leaving the profession, especially those under the age of 45, and it's creating issues in terms of a loss of expertise, but also in terms of the loss of future managers. Is that something that the Minister and the Department are aware of and are considering? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yes, Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. The leavers' data that we currently hold um, doesn't actually indicate if teachers are leaving to enter a new profession. However, in the last 12 months, there were 11 teachers under 45, nine, of, nine in secondary and two in primary. And I do think some of this is the result of the pandemic. People are choosing um, different career paths, um, and certainly there's um, opportunities on the island in, in many areas. Um, but with, with regards to what is the department doing about that, with regards to um, the future expertise, training is a key priority for, for me as, as, as the minister of the department to make sure that we are giving good career and um, continued professional development opportunities to all of our teachers. Again, this has been impacted due to COVID. Um, however, that is a programme that we are now up and running with again and will be continuing and obviously there is also opportunity within the department for any teacher to go on to the ILM 7 um, training to get a master's in teaching and that's fully funded by the department. Technically the hour for questions uh, is completed. Mr Morehouse. Mr Speaker, understand the notice to extend the to finish the last question please. Seconder for that motion. Mr Thomas. Thank you. Put the question that's uh, Question time be extended to permit the final question to be answered. Uh, those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Question 13. Call on the Honourable Member for Arby Castan Maloon. Mr Moore. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I would like to ask the Minister for Education, Sport and Culture how many supply teachers the department had on its register on the 1st of March 2020, 2021 and 2022. And Thank Minister you. Education, Sport and Culture to reply. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm able to provide the following information. On the 1st of March 2020, there were 431 supply teachers registered on the Education Supply Teacher Booking System. On the 1st of March 21, there were 479 registered. On the 1st of March 22, there were 556 teachers registered on that booking system. Um, and I'm hopeful that that was following um, the call for any retired teachers or anybody who newly arrived on the island to get on that register. Supplementary question, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you, Ms. for that encouraging piece of information. Um, in terms of the data for 2020 and 2021, <coughs> was any assessment made of whether or what percentage of those people were actually going into the classroom? Because the figures were impressive, 431 and 479, but other figures in terms of how many of those actually turned up and did a job in school and how often is the register actually cleansed do you look at the individual supply teachers to check availability and following the initial checks once someone goes onto the register are they then continue to able to teach for any number of years without further checks being carried out thank you mr speaker minister to reply thank you uh, mr speaker um, the period requested with the number of supply teachers we actually had 231 authorised bookings out of the 2021 um, register. Um, with regards to cleansing of the database, um, OHR carry out a termly check to identify those who haven't worked in the previous 12 months um, and make them inactive on the system. However, due to our need for additional supply teachers to help support during 
um, any COVID outbreak, we didn't, we didn't carry out that. However, anybody who's applied to go on the supply list will go through an interview process to assess suitability for the position as a supply teacher. Um, supply teachers as well, due to the system that's in place that uh, works two ways, they can make themselves inactive at any time and only make themselves available um, when they wish. Some further supplementary, Mr Moorhouse. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Um, it's been suggested that many people go into the register automatically once they retire, and it's a way to enter the Alice teaching profession. Is there any actual assessment of the number of people on the register who are inactive? In terms of that previous answer, we found out in 2020, half the people on the register weren't actually going into schools. Is that looked at in terms of why they're there and are they actually available? Thank you. Minister's reply. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And Actually, it's been really helpful that the Honourable Member has asked this question um, because, uh, personally, just to make somebody inactive and not have a conversation with them and establish why they're inactive or you know it could be for many reasons but i do think we need to keep the dialogue open and make sure we've got as many supply teachers available at all times to education so i will be looking into that and reviewing the process to make sure it is a, a continuum and also to make sure um, obviously your concerns with regards to checks ongoing um, that is key and we do need to make sure that that is part of that process Final supplementary, Mr Moorhouse. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you, Minister. In terms of the ongoing process, would stronger links in terms of the school informing of when um, supply teachers weren't available and leaving the register be a way to actually overcome that issue? And in terms of COVID, the numbers do suggest it hasn't had an impact, that people are still prepared to go in and work. Is, is that the case, that there's still that enthusiasm to become a supply teacher and do that? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Minister's reply. I think from the stats that I gave earlier, it's um, on the, that the number now is 556 proves that people are keen to help support education on our island. It is key to the future generations. Um, but with regards to the schools actually reporting that information back, it is all done in an electronic system. So um, that is where the information comes from. And um, as we know, an awful lot of supply teachers choose which schools they'd like to go to, and not all of them wish to go to all. Um, I, I would hope that we can expand that and make sure that the environments in all our schools are acceptable and that we have supply teachers willing to go into all of them.